All right, good morning, everyone. My name's Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at the Grove. It's good to be with you guys today. Um, obviously, I don't have the beard to be Mike. So uh, as you are going through your week, just if you think of uh, Mike, just say a prayer for his family. They're away on vacation. Um, and so just ask that this would be a time of refreshing for them. Um, and they'll be back again next week. But uh, it's always good to pray for your pastors. And I don't just say that because I'm one of them. I say that because I love the pastors that we get to serve with here. Um, I, I hope you guys have had a really good week. My week has been uh, fantastic. Um, busy, exhausting, but fantastic. Uh, and so uh, as we come here today, uh, I know that not everybody that is here in this room or watching online has had necessarily the best of weeks. And so one of the things that we like to do as a congregation prior to starting our time of worship is to take some time in silence and prepare our hearts for what the Lord would have for us today. And so let me invite you in this moment to just take a couple of moments in silence and prayer and ask that the Lord would be present in your lives today as we not only worship and interact with what Scripture has for us, um, but that our faith would be real, that our faith would help us to know Jesus loves us. And so let's take that time of silence as we prepare our hearts together. Almighty God, look upon us in your loving kindness and grant to us your abundant mercy and compassion. For to you belong all glory, honor, and worship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen.
guys join us in standing as we sing our next song? There is joy in the Lord, there is hope in His name, there is peace for our restless hearts. The weaver surrounds us, we will not be afraid, for the joy of the Lord is our name. You will not be moved, no trouble comes. Thank you, Lord, in this morning, in a world where so many circumstances uh, try to discourage and weigh us down, Lord, may we know as your people that your joy gives us strength. Father, I pray for our time together this morning. Lord, may we be sensitive to your spirits leading in our lives, and we pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and be seated, and if you are a part of Grove Kids that are heading downstairs, now's the time where you can do that.
All right. Um, well, I'm not going to introduce myself again because I'm, I was already up there. So uh, this morning, we're going to be continuing. <laughs> okay, my name is Scott, for those of you that don't know me, all right? Um, so we're going to be continuing our series, Living Kingdom, uh, here this morning, where we're working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. And what we've been doing is looking at the life and the teachings of Jesus and what that means for us today. And so I'm glad that you're here, whether that's here in this room or whether you're watching online. Um, I, we're gl- grateful that you're here. And I'd like to begin our time this morning with a story. All right? um, it's a story about a young German man. Uh, his parents were both artists, and he and his four brothers were all tutored in the arts. Don't worry, it's not Hitler. All right? Some of you are like, he paints. He painted. Scott's setting us up. I'm not doing that. Trust me. <clears throat> um, they were all tutored in the arts by their mother. But a young man named Henrik didn't just have a talent for art, it became a passion. This is a self-portrait that he did of himself. Um, His mother said of him, he will be an artist and nothing else. So he ended up being accepted into and went to study at one of the most prestigious academies uh, in Germany in 1842, and he apprenticed under a famous artist until leaving for the Netherlands, France, and eventually returning to Munich. He traveled into Rome as well. In his early career, as you could guess, maybe, he focused on painting portraits. And so people that were famous and important in the day, they would come and have their portraits painted by him. Now, in 1854, his mother passed away. And uh, her loss deeply affected him. And it it led him and inspired him into painting some of his first large religiously inspired paintings. It was called The Burial of Christ. And eventually, later that year, he began to reflect in 1854 to reflect on ancient arts, on Christianity and his faith, and some of the great masters of the arts from the Renaissance. And although much of his career as an artist wasn't focused on religious topics, Uh, From history, we we begin to realize that he was at home in the Bible, and his interest in Christian art, uh, you know, really took off just as culturally across Europe, the interest in Christian art was fading. And so uh, he really began to focus more on topics of faith, and some of them are ones that you may see as familiar. Uh, Christ at Gethsemane is one of those that's up there. Um, Because as, and this is why, as interest in Europe faded, interest in his pieces in America took off. And in fact, several of his paintings uh, were purchased and moved here. Uh, There's a church in Riverside Church in New York City, right right in Manhattan. Uh, They have four of his paintings on display. In fact, the one that has the frame there, that's one of his paintings. It's in the church. Um, it's interesting because most of his works that remained in Europe were destroyed in the wars. And so we have some of his pieces here in America that were preserved. Um, His art was seen as old-fashioned by the time that he died. Like he's painting it and they're saying this is old-fashioned. But this was something that he was passionate about. It was something that he found beauty in. And so even though it was old-fashioned in the eyes of like art critics, Um, It has found a home in churches. It has found a home in the lives and the homes and the churches of people of faith. And so, for example, you'll find some of those works uh, there at that church in New York City, Christ in Gethsemane, Jesus in the temple, the portrait of Christ or the capture of Christ. But there's one painting that may seem a little more familiar to you, especially if you've been here to the Grove. And it's on the stained glass right behind us. Right? So this is his painting, Christ and the Rich Young Ruler, or Christ and the Rich Young Man. It was done in 1889, a little less than three years before he passed away. And so as we work through our story today, working through our passage, it's interesting to think that someone who helped to build this structure thought that this painting was worth having a weekly reminder for the church. That this painting, they wanted to find a way to try and reproduce it so that 
Christians would have a moment of reflection. So, if you have your Bibles with you, make your way to Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to pick up in verse 16 today, which in many ways is continuing to build off of what we have been talking about for the last several weeks, and it's going to continue into chapter 20 as well, right? So Jesus and the disciples are together, and someone approaches him. In Mark and Luke's gospel, you can see this same thing happen, but this young man runs up to Jesus in those, in those passages, and he kneels before Jesus, and he asks a question. And in our passage, we're going to see two interactions, one between Jesus and this young man and another interaction between Jesus and his disciples after there's the initial conversation. And this is one of those passages that if you grew up in church, you've probably heard it taught in a variety of different contexts. Um, But our familiarity with this passage often will come between our ability to see it with fresh eyes and the eyes that the Spirit of God longs to lead us into with a deeper reality. And so, if you're familiar with this passage, let me encourage you, do your best to listen and uh, with fresh ears today. All right? So, beginning in Matthew, uh, verse 16, Matthew records this. He says, Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus responds, Why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Now, let's consider this initial interaction between Jesus and the young man, all right? He comes up to Jesus with the basic question of, good teacher, what do I have to do to have eternal life? What do I need to do to have eternal life? And this is is an incredibly important question. Right? It's a question that people are still asking today. It's a question that I hope you ask today. What is it that we need to do to get eternal life? And it would be very easy to presume that this young man doesn't really take his spiritual life seriously if you're familiar with this account. But in everything that we can read of this interaction between this person and Jesus, I have a very different perspective of his motivation. Right? He's a young man that takes his faith and spiritual life very seriously. And he's also aware enough to realize that his faithfulness to the law of Moses isn't producing in his life the kind of life and peace about the future that he thinks it should. So he's going through a lot of this religious motion, and there's still an angst inside of him. And he doesn't think that his religious practice alone is going to give him peace with God, and so he decides that he wants to go and talk to Jesus of Nazareth, a popular rabbi that's been proclaiming the reality of the kingdom of God and living a full life, what it means to live a full life as the children of God. And so he's like, you know what? I want to go talk to this Jesus. And so I want to see what he has to say about what's necessary for me to receive eternal life, this, this life that I feel like I'm missing. And so we can observe from his question that He also assumes that obtaining eternal life is tied up with what he needs to do. Eternal life, in his mind, is caught up in doing something. Trying to be worthy enough of this eternal life. He's convinced that his actions opened the door to eternal life. Now, this is the point where many of us that grew up in church might become uncomfortable with Jesus' answer. Because if you grew up around church, the question that this young man asked Jesus sets us up for what could be, like, honestly, Jesus, show us. Somebody asked you, what do I need to do to have eternal life? Jesus, you're going you're gonna to talk like what Paul talked about in Ephesians 2. Your, your salvation is going to be by God's grace through faith when we believe, right? That's what Jesus is going to say to him. But the answer that Jesus gives doesn't do that, but it does do two things. It pushes back on his worldview, and it asks him, why is he calling Jesus good? Because only God is good. And so Jesus, in this spot, isn't denying his deity. He's pushing the man to recognize who Jesus actually is. And the second thing the answer is doing is pushing this man to recognize that he isn't as good as he thinks he is. 
And so we have a man that's come to Jesus, but in his coming, we see this contrasting picture of humility that Jesus has just talked about earlier in chapter 19 and chapter 18, where children come to him, right? And then he refers to the disciples, and when they come to him, they need to have humility. That's like one of the identifying marks of the child of God, is that they come to Jesus in humility, recognizing that really there's nothing they can do for it. So Jesus answers this man's question by saying that to inherit eternal life, he needs to keep the commandments. And that's uncomfortable. But you have to understand Jesus is doing something here. This is not a simplistic answer where Jesus is saying that we're saved by doing good things. Jesus is getting right to the heart of the situation and he's forcing this young man to examine his actions and also why he is doing them in the first place. The other thing that's worth pointing out, as I said, about eternal life is he's asking for what do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus uses that phrase. And in my mind, because I grew up in church, when I hear eternal life, I only think about heaven, eternity. That's my natural default, is to go to the life after this one when I hear eternal life. But in the context, is that really what Jesus is doing? And I, I don't believe so. I think what he's doing here is he's, He's asking, or they're talking about, more than just what happens after we die. It's not a question about the time that we begin to experience eternal life. It's a question more about the quality of life. A life that looks like God is in charge, and that kind of life begins now and carries on through our lives today and tomorrow until we enter into eternity where it continues. He was feeling, this young man was feeling angst because something in his life wasn't lining up with what he thought he should be experiencing about the peace of eternal life, about life the way that it was meant to be. And so he goes to Jesus and he asks, what do I need to do? And Jesus, masterfully knowing this man's heart, says, you need to keep all the commandments. And if you do that, you'll receive eternal life. Now, for me, when I hear that, I just know how much I struggle to be faithful to do what God wants me to do all the time, consistently. Like, there's a struggle there. I, I would never be somebody that would sit back and go, oh, yeah, I, I do that. I keep all the commandments. Yeah, sure. I live my life according to the ways of Jesus all the time. My humanity never shows up in awkward and inopportune times, right? No, no, no. But this guy says, oh, let's pick it back up in verse 18. He, the man says, which ones? The man asked. And Jesus replied, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are things that Jesus says. Sound familiar? Like we would refer to them as the Ten Commandments, right? There's a, a big chunk of those that are right here. And this guy's response is, I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied, replied. What else must I do? Now, again, this is a response from Jesus from what we would consider the Ten Commandments. And so this is a pretty bold answer from this young guy. He's confident that he has obeyed the law. But his obedience to the law didn't transform the way he felt about life and faith. Doing what God wanted him to do didn't result in the transformed life that he knew deep down he needed to experience. And we know that because the very next thing that he says is, well, what else must I do? Jesus, I've done all of these things. What else do I have to do? And I think it's worth mentioning that his question, like which commands do I need to obey for eternal life? gives us a little more insight into his thinking because it would seem that he doesn't fully understand that God requires perfection both in how we act and in our hearts. And so I believe that Jesus is pushing this young man to realize that he isn't as good as he thinks he is. 
But this guy is looking at his life and his faith like a bunch of check marks on a box. Oh, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. And he seems to blow right past this statement from Jesus and is like, yeah, I've done all that. I'm good. What else do I have to do? Like, let me get beyond the basic Sunday school stuff, Jesus. I haven't killed anybody. I've avoided adultery. I'm not a thief. I'm not a liar. I've honored my parents. I love my neighbor like I love myself. Yeah, I've done all that. What's next? Come on. And what, what's it going to take for me to reach this next level of spirituality and deliver me from the peace that I seem to be missing? But, but Jesus isn't giving him a list of to-dos to be saved. He's getting at what is coming out of your life as a byproduct of your faith and salvation. See, Jesus isn't giving him a checklist of to-dos. He's saying, these are the things that flow out of your life when you are a child of God. And you might simply read what Jesus says here and not notice that he seems to have skipped a few of those Ten Commandments, right? Like, you should have no other gods before me. You shouldn't covet, right? Some of those, particularly the first and the tenth commandments, are not there. And so it's almost like Jesus, in some way, is prompting this young man to think more deeply about his life and faith. But he's on a mission. This guy's on a mission, and he's not going to be distracted by anything, you know? So, especially what Jesus doesn't say, because he's trying to get an answer. How many of you guys are like that type A personality? That you get something set on your mind, and you're just like, I'm going for it. All right? You don't have to be type A. You could just be like me and just like fixate on something and just be like, oh, I got to figure this out. All right? This is what this guy's doing. He's like, I got, I, 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 Jesus, I want to know this. Uh, yeah, I, okay, don't, don't interrupt me with those kinds of things, Jesus. I just need the answer. Help me to sort this out. And look what Jesus says to him in verse 21. Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when this young man heard this, he went away sad for he had many possessions. And this is the scene that Henrik Hoffman tried to capture in his painting. Jesus brings a spotlight to this very young and wealthy man and he says, okay, so if you are so convinced that you have completely obeyed the law, if you really want to be perfect, if you really want to go to the next step for you to experience eternal life, which that word perfect is more about being fully mature and experiencing the life that God has for him rather than, than like being perfect and infallible, right? Jesus says, go and sell everything that you have. Go and sell everything that you have and give that money to the poor and know that you're going to have treasure in heaven. You're going to have treasure in the life to come and then you come and you follow me. And Matthew says the man went away sad because he had a lot of stuff. And there are so many things worth pointing out here in this passage. But I want you to notice, first of all, that out of all the crowds that had been following Jesus, out of all the people that he has interacted with throughout the accounts of Matthew, Jesus actually invited this young man to become one of his disciples. And sometimes our familiarity with this passage, we just breeze right past that. Like Jesus invited him to come and be a part of the disciples to learn the ways of life from Jesus. He came seeking an answer to the nagging feeling that he was missing out on the life that God had made for him in this life and the life to come. And he wanted Jesus to help him figure out why. And so as Jesus begins pointing out that perfection was necessary for that kind of life, this young man is almost like, yeah, 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 Jesus, I, I, I've been doing that stuff since I was a kid, Right? What else do I need to do? And Jesus, then he says, like, if you really want to experience this life that you're looking for, sell everything, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. And it says he left sad because following Jesus was going to cost him everything. Everything. 
And he couldn't, he couldn't wrap his brain around that. Like, Jesus, you, you want me to sell it all? You want me to get rid of it all and then, and then give it to the poor people? And so he does something that I think, you know, a lot of people don't do because he believed Jesus. He probably believed Jesus more than a lot of people I know because he understood that when Jesus said, sell it all and then come follow me, and he knew he wasn't willing to do that, he walked away. He said, I'm not ready for that, Jesus. And so he was discouraged and sad, and he left. I think he understood that Jesus has said, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and something else at the same time because you're either going to hate one and love the other or vice versa. And so this young man realized that what he had hoped Jesus would reveal to him about how to receive eternal life, that kind of life that reveals that God was in charge and would continue into eternity meant that he had to let go of things that mattered so much to him, the things that mattered most to him. And here, here's the painful part of the story for me, is that Jesus let him walk away. Jesus invited him to be a disciple. He understood what the cost was going to be, and he left sad, and Jesus let him go. That's heavy. Because I think a lot of us would sit back and say, you know what, I think, you know, I, I believe that God came after me. I believe that God wouldn't, like, just let me be. But in this instance, Jesus lets him go. Jesus knew where his heart was at and wasn't going to try to make him, like, well, hey, okay, don't walk away, all right? You, you, can, you can keep most of the stuff, just come and follow me, right? Jesus didn't go like, oh, you know, that really nice donkey you've got, go ahead, keep that, right? And then, you know, just bring it along with you, and then you can come follow me. No, keep your house, and then, and then, and then you know, you don't have to sell it. Maybe you could just let somebody borrow it and then go pick it up later. Jesus didn't say that. He said, sell it all and come follow me. And when the guy realized what was going on and walked away, Jesus let him go. Now, I want to say Jesus is telling him to sell everything and then come follow him is not normative. It's not, like, it's not normal in what you see in the Bible. In fact, this is the only time where Jesus says this to anyone. Nowhere else does Jesus tell someone to sell everything that they have and give it to the poor in order to become a disciple of Jesus. And so if you slow down and think about it, in the stories of Jesus' life and ministry, he was supported by people that had money. The early church was supported by, by people that had money. Jesus was buried in a tomb of, one of, of someone that was a wealthy follower of him, a wealthy disciple. Or if you think about other people that Jesus interacted with, like Zacchaeus, who was kind of a corrupt tax collector, that Jesus went and spent an afternoon with him and it changed his life. He says, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to pay back everybody that I've robbed. I'm going to pay them more because like, that's what I need to do. And Jesus, in that, he didn't demand that from Zacchaeus, but there was a response to recognize what Jesus had done for him. Disciples like Peter don't seem to have sold everything that they had to follow Jesus because it seems like Peter kept his home. And at least one of the disciples that was a fisherman probably had their boat as well. So Jesus isn't just talking about money in this situation. You've got to sell it all. That's, that's not the case. Jesus is talking to a very specific person that has a very specific need and a very specific barrier between him and God and the life that he thinks he wants. Jesus lays this out because he knew what mattered most to this man. And so having money is not the issue, but
But when your money and possessions have you, that's a different thing. And, and this brings me to the point I'd like to make that I believe kind of starts to bring this all together. And it's a little note about the culture of this day when this scene takes place. See, within, within this time frame, people that possessed wealth were seen as having been blessed by God. They were given respect and priority because it was obvious to everyone else that because things were going well for them and they had financial resources to spare, that God favored them. That somehow they were closer to God than someone who was poor and struggling. And you know, that hasn't necessarily changed. Sometimes we still look at people whose life seems to be going easy for them and we're like, oh, they must be living right. Sometimes we find our hearts looking at other people and going, oh, I wish I had what they have. And so, so when the disciples who were with Jesus at this point saw a rich, young, influential leader come to Jesus, it's very likely that they were convinced that this guy was close to God. And then he's asking Jesus how to obtain eternal life. And Jesus invites him to become a disciple. And they must have felt that rise of emotion of like, yeah, all right. We're going to have some more influence because this guy's got, you know, some clout in the community. Only to watch as this young man's face fell when Jesus says, if you really want eternal life, you need to give up everything and follow me. Like, Sell it all and give the money away. Burn the bridges. There's no safety net anymore. I'm your safety net. Come and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And they watch him walk away. And this must have blown their minds. Because <laughs> as much as Jesus didn't go after him, there's a part of me that feels like the disciples would have been happy to. All right? Because this is what we see Jesus say to the disciples, picking up in verse 23, then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And as this man is walking away off in the distance, Jesus points out to the disciples that it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, and he illustrates it with an impossible situation that people have tried to like explain, to like be like, how many of you guys have heard like the, the camel through like the small gate? You know, yeah, you got, yeah, that's not, that's not legit. It just, it was, became so popular that a lot of people just assume that, what, for those of you that aren't aware, right? So there's this idea of a camel. There's this, this idea that a walled city had this little tiny gate that was really, really difficult to get like, that, so the main gates could be closed, but a camel if it got down on its knees and it took all of its, you know, stuff that it was carrying off, it could then, you know, you could force it through that. But it was really, really difficult. And so the early church was like, hey, that's a, that's a good idea. I like that because that sounds a whole lot better than Jesus saying it's impossible <laughs> for somebody that's rich to get into heaven. So we'll make an excuse. Sometimes they say, oh, camel isn't actually the word that's used there. Maybe it's like a, a rope. And so a rope isn't going to fit through. No, no. That's not the case. Jesus is telling a story that sets up an impossible situation. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is what the disciples do. They go, well then, who can be saved? That's what they say, verse 25. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they ask. And Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. And this is a good place to let the words of Jesus settle in today. Because the young man that walked away got it. And the disciples got it as well. You and I 
cannot live in a kingdom with two kings. And even though the disciples had an understanding of wealth as the sign of God's favor, in reality, it was a barrier because it had become a security blanket rather than finding their security in God. And here's the scary thing for us today in this room is that financial affluence is dangerous because we often compare ourselves to others that have more than us. And so we never really think that we're that rich. And so we're kind of lulled into this contentment and complacency rather than moving into a deeper trust and reliance on God. We drift into finding our joy and our stability in the gift rather than the giver. And when that happens, to you or to me, it means that we are drifting down a dangerous path away from the heart of God. But these words of Jesus to his disciples do a couple things that I think are very applicable for us today. They remind us that our salvation as the people of God isn't the result of our ability to be good enough. Salvation by our works is impossible. Whether we're rich or poor, a good, fine, moral, upstanding person, or somebody that's been given enough bruises and wounds in life to make everybody uncomfortable to look at them, we all need to recognize that our salvation only comes through the mercy of God. Because if it was up to us, it is impossible. I also think it's worth acknowledging that when Jesus invited this man to sell everything and give it to the poor, he wasn't exchanging something or everything for nothing. He was gaining treasure in the life to come and joy in the present world that far exceeds the security and comfort money could give him. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But as we follow Jesus, it's just worth acknowledging that Jesus isn't giving us a bait and switch. He's not promising us, like telling you, just give everything in, like live trusting me, and then <laughs> pull the rug out from underneath of you. He is promising blessings in this life now and for eternity. And so it isn't wrong, listen, it isn't wrong to look forward to our eternal rewards. Too often our focus is just what's happening right in front of us and we forget that Jesus didn't talk about eternal blessings as like a negative thing. I'm not talking prosperity gospel. I'm not like, and if you don't know what that is, great. I'm so happy for you, right? It's this really twisted thing that says if you live the way God wants you to live, you're going to be blessed. You're going to have more money. You're going to have health. You're going to have all these really great things. That is nothing of what you will read when you see the life of Jesus in Scripture. That is nothing that you will see Jesus teach. But don't discount the fact that Jesus does say there are blessings and joys for those that follow him. And some of those things are the life to come. And so we look forward to that as Christians. We look forward to the fact that God will eventually one day make all things right and we will exist in his presence without a need or a fear or a tear. And so as we close this morning, I want to encourage you to consider the stained glass behind me. Consider the scene that it represents in Matthew. Consider that if you've come to Jesus hungry for a life that has meaning and purpose, a life that reflects the reality of God's presence in your life now and in the life to come, then you probably are going to have a couple of responses. One of them, is that you may just need to pause and praise God for the reality of your life. To pause with gratitude and say, thank you, Lord, for how you have provided for me both now and in the life to come as your child. You may 
want to take some time and examine your life and see if there is something that Jesus would rather you let go of so that you could enter into the life that God has for you. Some place of security outside of your faith in Christ and the good God that is taught to us in Scripture. For the young man in our passage, it was his stuff that came between him and God. But for you, it might be a relationship. It might be a career path or a retirement plan. It might be a number of things. I don't know your story. I don't know where you find comfort outside of your faith in Christ. But please know that just as Jesus invited this man to come to a point to say, okay, Jesus, you are worth more than everything I have. That invitation is still available for us today. That possessing Jesus and the life that he offers to us is worth more than anything and everything that we could have. When life is going well and when the bottom drops out. He is worth it. If you've got questions about what it means to start trying to follow Jesus with your life, then we would love to talk with you. If, if you're struggling to figure out how do I let go of something that means so much to me, then we'd love to talk with you and try to help you process that. Jesus didn't twist this guy's arm, and so as people that try to live like Jesus... We do our best to not try and twist your arm and manipulate you into uh, living in a way that we think is in alignment with Scripture. We believe that the Spirit of God is alive and at work inside of you if you are His child. And He will bring conviction where it's needed. And He will bring comfort where it's needed. And He will help you. Because it's through your faith, not your works, that you are transformed in a way to experience eternal life. And so my hope for us as a church, my hope for you as men and women and young adults and, and students is that you would come to see that Jesus is worth it and that your faith wouldn't be discouraged and broken, but that you would find hope in understanding that what you can't do, God has already done for you and you just have to respond to it. Let's pray. Father, there's so much that's going on here in this passage. And I know that there are so many things that pull for our attention. So many things that our minds look to for comfort and security apart from you. Lord, today as we consider this scene, Lord, it may not be money that we find our comfort or security in. It may be something else. But Lord, in all of it, may you reveal to us the places in our lives where we look to trust in something other than you. And may you help us to know that your scripture promises that change is possible through you and your spirit. May we pursue holiness and obedience to you. And Lord, may we experience the joy of life that you say can be ours as your children, saved by grace through faith because of what Jesus has done for us. And we pray this all in his most glorious name. Amen.
in the morning when I rise. Yeah, in the morning when I rise. In the morning when I rise. Give me In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me
deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is in standing as we sing our last time song together today. To God be the glory, great things he has done, and love be the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life like a stone man for sin, and opened the life that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Yeah. 
every believer The promise of God The vilest offender Who truly believes That moment from Jesus A part of the we have to be your children and that it is not an exchange of everything we have for nothing but it's everything that we have for so much more Lord I'd pray that your spirit would have the freedom to encourage those that need encourage today to convict those that need conviction to bring healing to those that need it Lord you are good and may the way that we live be reflections of your goodness to us and we pray this all in Jesus name I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Have a great week. We'll see you guys soon.